poof, gone. 20% of your money vanished into thin air. If you only invest in stocks and bonds, that's what you're looking at, according to the geniuses at Goldman Sachs. They say real assets are key to salvaging those 20% losses. Real assets like contemporary art. That's right. The same kind of art you see on the walls of museums. This art has outpaced the S&P 500 by more than double for the last 26 years and it performs even better than real estate and gold when inflation is this high. One company has even beaten those numbers. They're called Masterworks and they've averaged a net return of 29% to investors from just six exits. Even through COVID, a bear market and sky high inflation, some of you early adopters who already signed up saw their exit in August for a 33.1% return. That's right, 33.1%. Obviously, with numbers like that, demand is surging and there is a wait list. But you can skip it just by going to masterworks.io slash sadtruth. That's masterworks.io slash sadtruth. See important regulation A disclosures at masterworks.io slash cd. That's masterworks.io slash sad truth. Hi, everybody. This is Gad Sad for the Sad Truth. Today, I have another fantastic guest. Dr. Scott Atlas is a neuroradiologist. He's going to tell us what that is in a second. He was a professor at uh, Stanford University, was the chief neuroradiologist there. And uh, we'll talk about the, the, the topic of his latest book, which is titled A Plague Upon Our House, My Fight at the Trump White House to stop COVID from destroying America. Welcome, Scott. How are you doing? Great. Good to be here. Just one correction as we start. Uh, you know, this is sort of, again, one of the false narratives that has taken hold. I have not been a, I'm not a neuroradiologist. That's in the past. I have been 100% full time a health policy scholar at a public policy think tank at Stanford for more than a decade. I have not been in medicine for more than a decade. That's a that would be like saying I was a uh, you know I was a philosopher in, a, in, in from 1990 to 2000. Uh, so it's relevant because I have a 25 year history in, in medical science uh, and understand you know how to analyze uh, in a critical way data. Uh, but this is sort of a pigeonholing. Uh, that has been done that this guy's a neuroradiologist what does he know whereas the questions of the pandemic are health policy questions and i was the only health policy scholar that was in the room at the task force right. so anyway I thank that you. correction actually i forgot to mention that uh you know your affiliation with the hoover institution so thank you for but, that yeah. correction yeah uh, that that is my full-time position it's not just an affiliation so at, at at Hoover Institution, you're not mandated to 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 teach at all, right? You're you're just a a researcher. You're a scholar. You're writing papers, possibly writing books. But there are there is no sort of onerous mandates for administration or teaching, as would be the case in a typical professorship, correct? That's right. It's a it's a policy institute, uh, not a department, and the mission is really sort of to be productive and impactful. Now, I personally uh, run, co-direct, the only, what was the flag, what still is really, the flagship educational program there for students. Uh, but that was something that I devised about five or six years ago, a public policy immersion course uh, over the summer on application-based course. So in terms of this, the year though, that we do engage with students, we have independent engagements, all the uh, so-called senior fellows, which I am one of, which is a tenured professor equivalent. And so we work with uh, students uh, on an ad hoc basis. Most of us do some sort of teaching on an ad hoc basis, but you're if you're full-time Hoover, you're not required to, uh, you know, have a formal course. Gotcha. Now, uh, the next question I'm going to ask you, in a sense, is related to my own. I'm about 10 years younger than you. I've been a professor for almost uh, 30 years. And while it's in my DNA to be a professor, some of the elements of being a professor are becoming 
too taxing for me. I mean, other than, of course, being an outspoken person who, you know, gets targeted as you you have been, uh, you know, I, I, I love the teaching in, in the sense of getting up in front of the class to profess about some theory. I don't enjoy the grading. I don't enjoy the whining. I don't enjoy the entire, I mean, I'm more scared. I, I, I semi-joke that having gone through the Lebanese Civil War as a Lebanese Jew and escaped execution, that is less scary than when I post my grades at the end of the semester and I await the tsunami of, of nonsense that's going to hit me. So in my case, I'm I'm contemplating at this point whether you know I'm in for the long haul for another 10, 20, 30 years, or whether I wish to assume something different, like, like for example, a position at, that you have at Hoover. In your case, when you left the practice of medicine and being a professor, what was that the type of calculations you had gone through to arrive at that decision? Well, you know, okay, so there's a little bit of a wrinkle with the way uh, teaching in a professional school is, because my teaching uh, as a as a professor for 30 years at uh, academic medical centers, my position was threefold. It was clinical medicine, it was research. Uh, and directing a group of research, <clears throat> uh, you know, other faculty, and it was education. But most of the education was not that I did, and that people in subspecialty level positions like mine were, uh, are not to students that often. It's mainly to doctors. It's to doctors in training. But when you have uh, reach a certain level, w which I had, uh, you are teaching mainly other doctors, other subspecialists all over the country and all over the world and as a, as a visiting professor. So, uh, you know, I, I gave over 600 invited lectures uh, at, at academies, symposia and universities over the years of, of being a professor in, in medicine. Um, it's different. We don't have to deal with, at least I didn't have to deal with grading. It was much more for... Uh, talking about the, you know, educating uh, already practicing physicians and other medical scientists on, on the, what's, what's up, what's the current uh, state of things, what's coming, and the principles, of course, of being a diagnostic neuroradiologist, which was my field. Got you. Uh, maybe we can drill down a bit on what neuroradiology is. And I have a, a, a slight professional interest in, in what you're about to answer in that I've written a, a couple of uh, academic papers, one in Frontiers in Neuroscience, another one in a in a consumer psychology journal, where I was critiquing. Uh, this is each of these two papers was one was with a postdoc, one was with a graduate student, where I was critique critiquing the brain imaging paradigm, not so much for its value as a diagnostic tool in the practice of medicine, but in an academic research where you're trying to predict behavior, right? I'm in the business, I'm an, as an evolutionary and consumer psychologist, I'm interested in describing behavior, predicting behavior. And I argued, it's a term that I slightly modified and bored from one of my former doctoral professors, Frank Kyle, the illusion of explanatory profundity. The idea being that, you know, uh, brain imaging, it, well, images, they, they feel sciency, they look sciency. So if you throw in one of these images, you can concoct any post hoc story afterwards that can fit any data pattern, but that in reality doesn't truly help us increase our explanatory power. What are your thoughts on that? Do you agree? Do you disagree? What are your, th what's your thought? Well, I think you're, you're, you're right. I mean, it's ironic. Uh, this is a very good topic because I, I wrote the main book in magnetic resonance imaging of the brain that's used and it's been translated into four or five languages, and um, <clears throat> you're, you're, you're exposing <clears throat> what any real critical thinker should say and understand, which is that most research, as my friend Johnny Anides became famous for saying and pointing out, most research was, was garbage, basically. Most research is not reproducible. It's only correlational, okay? And so... Your 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 uh, point here is that yes, we we infer quite a bit from things that seem to be scientific, concrete, hard data. But the reality is, I completely agree with you, and I'll go even further that we know very little about medical science compared to what people think we know. <laughs> and so, uh, a lot of it is sort of empirical. A lot of things are well. Let's try this. Uh, people have inferred all kinds of 
uh, conclusions from very bad scientific studies. And frankly, the height of that was exposed during the pandemic. Yeah, we'll we'll come to that. Hold on, hold on to that. I, I want to stay within your specialty. Yeah. There is, I don't know if you've heard the term greedy reductionism. It's a term that captures the idea that that oftentimes scientists, especially hard scientists, like to drill down to sort of the lowest level, you know, unit of analysis. And then they think that it is really at that sort of, you know, uh, rigorous level that we can truly explain behavior. So, for example, in my first book that I wrote, I talk about greedy reductionism as relating to the brain imaging paradigm. And I argue, look, you can try to study the neuronal firing patterns of soccer players to try to predict who's going to win the World Cup. But that would be pure bullshit, right? That, you know, as a scientist, you really have to know at what epistemological level you need to be targeting your unit of analysis. But there's this kind of orgiastic debauchery that comes with having fancy tools like brain imaging that just makes most people succumb to the allure of it just feels so sciencey. That's that's right. I, I, I agree with you that uh, and, and in a sort of a lay a lay language sort of way, things are a lot more complicated than how they're put forward. And so yes, you want to be as sort of objective in a in a controlled experimental way like you're talking about, talk about something that can be isolated. Uh, but the reality is that most of these things are are not isolated. It's an oversimplification, and it's actually ends up being bad science because you can't even anticipate the factors that are influencing the outcome. I mean, uh, to think that again, this goes to correlational, by the way. Correlation, what what I mean by that, as you know, is that correlation does not imply cause and effect. There's a whole website of ludicrous correlations that have extremely high statistical correlation that are nonsensical. But uh, this is the sort of thing that people fall into, uh, including very, you know, very productive researchers. And again, uh, one of the most cited papers in the world was Ian Needy's paper talking about this sort of thing. Um, I'd I'd like to, at some point... uh... Uh, maybe have him on the show to explain to me how someone can publish 60 or 70 papers on COVID alone, knowing how long it typically takes for an academic paper paper to be conceived and then, you know, go through the peer review process. He must have some magic sauce that I'm unfamiliar with in the past 30 years as a professor. So, or maybe you know what his secret sauce is. Well, John is is really, I, I respect him. Uh, I, I can't think of someone who I respect more for being research. Uh, sort of a critical thinker. A lot of the stuff that John uh, has written has been uh, meta analyses, which which uh, about COVID, which are looking at the data of published papers, uh, and I think that's very valuable. He has pointed out this incredible explosion of papers. Of course, common sense tells you most of the papers that were written by others were garbage because they were they were very simplistic. Uh, sort of correlational analyses. They didn't undergo any kind of serious, uh, even if they did undergo peer review, you know, a a lot of bias-entered science uh, in this whole thing. And so, yeah, I mean, some people are prolific, uh, but of course, uh, more prolific than others. But uh, John is somebody who really is a special, uh, special person and should be paid attention to because he is introducing what we need, which is skepticism and critical assessment of of the research itself. Well, I think uh, I'm going to ask you a few more questions in medicine, then we'll get into the whole COVID stuff. Uh, For those of you who don't know, uh, Scott and I met for the first time at the Stanford Academic Freedom uh, Conference that was held last uh, month. And I think the three people that... uh, struck me the most uh, as a, as, I mean, I, I also spoke at the conference, but I, of course I was an audience member, were yourself, John and Jay, all of whom I would uh, qualify or categorize as honey badgers. In, in the last chapter of this book, The Parasitic Mind, I talk about activating your inner honey badger. And the reason why I use the honey badger is because it is, I mean, literally has been uh, rated as or ranked as the most fierce animal. And not because it's huge, but because it is just so fierce and ferocious. And when I tell people to activate your inner honey badger, I'm not asking them to be violent. It's not a call to violence, but it's a it's yeah. a call to triggering your indignation if you think you're right. If you've got the the data, the evidence to support your position, never cower, never go into a fetal position. And I think each of you in your unique 
ways. You know, Jay is a bit more soft spoken. Uh, John was a bit more fiery. You were perhaps somewhere in the middle. You all, you know, exemplify what it is to be a honey badger. Well, yeah, I, I, I think that's a good analogy, but yeah, and we could talk about this. There, there is a, there's a reason I didn't go into any of this, uh, thinking uh, just simply adamantly that I'm right. Uh, I wasn't, there's no question I was right. That stuff was known that I was saying, but in addition, you have to realize as you do, people were dying because of what was wrong. It's not just a game. It's not just proving you're right at all. And I'm not saying you were implying that, but I just think, you know, why would somebody, and I, and I, I like to think through this because I'm still trying to contemplate, why would somebody be willing to uh, sort of go out there and speak against conventional wisdom and go through all the death threats and all the harassment and all of the, uh, it, it, you know, uh, completely irrational criticism by my own employer, for instance. Um, and there's a reason. And the reason is right is right. And people were dying. And you, you, you have to, at some point, realize what's at stake here. And, and I, I can go through uh, how I came to the, the motivations during this whole process, because I think it's it's important for people to know, because we need people with integrity to step up so okay so then that it's i guess it's a segue we if if we have time we can circle back to some of the medical stuff that i was hoping to ask you so start with you know here are the sort of the accepted covid policies that were enacted in a somewhat ad hoc haphazard way and here comes scott atlas saying wait a second you know herd herd immunity uh you know don't, don't do these draconian shutdowns so give us a general sense of what the accepted wisdom was, what you and a few others, you know, the great uh, Barrington Declaration were saying, and then where are we today? If we conducted that meta-analysis on each of the contentious issues that, you know, got you into, quote, hot hot waters, where would the data fall on each of those issues? Sure. So uh, I'll do it in a sort of a historical timeline context. So, uh, you know, I was busy in January rewriting a book I have on reforming America's healthcare system in anticipation of the uh, sort of election coming up, then 2020, I'm talking about, uh, where I thought healthcare, healthcare reform would be a big topic. And then we get this uh, information out of China and the World Health Organization talking about the infection fatality rate being extraordinarily high and frighteningly high. And uh, of course, by the time end of February rolled around, beginning of March, lockdowns were uh, being pushed and put into place. And I came out, there were three of us who wrote publicly in March of 2020, and really only three who came out nationally, uh, Johnny Anides, uh, David Katz, and myself all wrote independent pieces calling for something called targeted protection in March of 2020 which meant we're the strategy involved here of locking down everybody is not working because it's not protecting the known high risk people from dying. People were dying in the nursing homes. At some point in some states, 75% of deaths were inside nursing homes. Every medical student in the world understood on day one that the highest risk people for any potentially lethal upper respiratory infection is almost always the elderly and frail. And nursing homes are regulated environments already. You can't just walk into a nursing home and see your your relatives. So this was sort of a a huge failure. And then secondly, the lockdowns, locking down school children who had already been proven by March of 2020 to have extremely low risk, healthy children for serious illness and were proven by end of spring 2020 to not be significant spreaders of the virus. That was proven, that was known from dozens of studies all over the country. And so we were locking up and destroying everybody, including low, low the lowest people I'm talking about here, low income families and the poor particularly, and children, and also failing to do the heightened protection that we needed of the elderly. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. Even when I came to the White House in August of 2020, beginning, I that you know, Dr. Burks leaned across the table and said, We're doing everything we can to protect the elderly. And I said, Really? How? This is inside the task force. 
I said, how often are you testing nursing home staff? And she said, once a week. And I said, well, that, that's nowhere near enough. All the cases into a nursing home are brought in by the staff. That was already proven and known. Uh, we also knew, by the way, for decades that even a common cold brought into a nursing home is massively destructive and causes death. These people are that frail, that feeble, of course. And so I said, we should be testing three times a week, five times a week, the nursing home staff. That was just one simple example. And I pushed for that and other things. So in March of 2020, the three of us independently wrote for, for increasing the protection of the elderly and the high risk and stopping the destruction of the lockdowns. And by the way, that was the standard pandemic policy outlined in October in 2006 by the people who were credited with eradicating smallpox, Henderson and college. Standard pandemic management said lockdowns are destructive, they don't work, and they shouldn't be used. Destructive, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Destructive specifically on the metric of reducing uh, infection and death or on a multi-attribute perspective? For example, they're destructive to the economy, therefore the cost-benefit says that you shouldn't lock down. Which they is were just, okay, what I'm saying is that they were known to be ineffective, there's two things, ineffective and harmful. Ineffective, meaning they do not stop the dust. They do not stop the infections from spreading when they're respiratory viruses. And destructive, because when you shut down things, this is another one of the false dichotomies that was presented to the public to convince the public. It was a lie that saying, if you're against lockdowns, you're choosing the economy over lives. There were decades and it was known and still is and now has been more, more and more proven. Severe economic downturns kill people. Yeah. It's not an economic issue. It is lives versus lives. And in fact, I wrote a paper in May of 2020 on the Hill with an economist from University of Chicago and others about how in the first two months of lockdown, the number of life years lost was worse from the lockdown than from the virus by a factor of two. Double the number of life years lost from the lockdown wow. because the severe economic downturns. And what's what's the unethical, heinous indictment of our society about this is that that kind of policy, the lockdowns, harm the poor and low-income families. Okay, so this is known. First of all, the school closures target, and this has been proven by studies over and over again, including the 2022 study funded by UNICEF and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, that the poor children were destroyed. And secondly, the data from Harvard and other uh, economics departments shows that the massive economic harms were specifically worse for the low-income jobs, low-income families. And so, as everyone common sense would know, single-parent families, people who don't have uh, the laptop class, as Martin Kulderf likes to say, you know, uh, we shifted the burden as a society. The lockdowns shifted the burden of the illness from the affluent class to the low-income families. I thought we were an ethical society. I thought we were supposed to care about poor people. In fact, I thought we were supposed to care about our children. Instead, we became a society using children as shields for diseases. Uh, so, I mean, there's so many things to, to explore here. I'm sorry to go off, but the timeline of the of this was in March, we came out, the three of us independently. In the spring, it turned out that uh, myself, Johnny Anides, and, and Katz were invited independently to testify in May to the Department of Homeland Security on pandemic management in the Senate by a distance, from a distance. And we did that and we, we, we found out we were all saying the exact same thing. Months go by, more people came out over the summer. And then finally, seven months later, the Great Barrington Declaration was written in October of 2020, okay? Uh, by then, seven months, eight months of lockdown destruction had occurred. What was the value? I, I would like to, to say this. There is a big value, as I mentioned in that conference, to the Great Barrington Declaration. What is the value? The value was that it codified something and put forward something by three highly credible medical scientists, Martin Kulldorff of Harvard, Jay Bhattacharya of Stanford, Sinatra Gupta of Oxford. It codified something in very simple language 
uh, even though it was late, that people would say, hey, I agree with that. Right. There's something I agree with. And when you speak out, this is an illustration that, of course, I I learned because I wasn't even a public figure before that. Uh, I learned that the value of speaking out is not just to say the truth. It's not just to be an individual voice in the in the in the face of a counter narrative that is completely wrong and destructive. It's also very importantly to empower others to speak yeah. up. Yeah. And because nothing will be solved, as you know, nothing will come from top down to solve the problems we have in society. It all has to come in, at least I'll say in my view, from uh, individuals who have the courage to speak up and empower other individuals because we need to fix our society on so many levels. These are levels and things that were exposed by the pandemic. It's not the pandemic anymore. It's ex what was exposed about society, I think. Beautiful. So uh, as, a, as a behavioral scientist and a psychologist, I'm in, ultimately interested in the, as I said earlier, in the reasons why people do the things that they do, the positions that they take, the behaviors that they partake in. And so if I am trying to uh, offer an explanation for why you face the type of, uh, you know, uh, blowback against you and so on, the, I can propose one or two, but then some of it is mysterious to me. And then maybe you can you know, speculate or fill in the blanks. Sure. So one would be what I hinted at earlier, which is that you know when you're when you're developing, and, and you may know this, but I'm I'm saying this for the, the value for the for the viewers and the listeners. Uh, when you're developing an optimization model, say in operations research or what's also called management science, uh, you you have an objective function that you're either trying to minimize something or maximize something, but usually those objective functions have multi attributes on which you're trying to minimize or maximize something or you're trying to maximize or minimize sub something subject to other constraints and so for example it might be i want the highest uh, reward for my financial investment subject to my risk tolerance so the world is not uni uni variables where you're only trying to minimize or maximize a single thing so i could if i'm going to put on my charitable hat my non-cynical hat I'm going to say, well, even very bright people who are tasked with, with you know, providing us with public policy and health policy decisions might succumb to the cognitive bias of viewing the, the world through the lens of a singular variable to maximize or minimize, whereas both you and I know that that's a insanely you know uh, simplistic view of the world. So that would be one possible explanation. The other stuff, then we start entering into nefarious world, right? It's what I call the govern me harder daddy, right? So people get this desire, you know, religion solves that purpose. It 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 removes any choices that I have to make. It tells me when to light the Shabbat candles, what to do on Saturday, what I can eat, what I can't eat. And I get great uh, uh, solace in having that subcontracted to some higher power. In this case, the higher power is no longer God, it's big government. What are your views about these two explanations? And is there any other factor that I'm missing that might explain why you received the blowback that you did? So I think you're 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 outlining a couple of very important things. I agree with actually many things happened, but there were there were certain specific things that I think explain things. Number one, and this is what I saw in inside, but this was the biggest flaw of all, was the people, the public health leadership was focusing on a single end result, which is stop COVID cases, period. And so it's not just simplistic or naive or completely, you know, irrational, really, but it's destructive because that's that's actually violates the most basic common sense tenets of public health guidance because public health guidance is supposed to focus on health. It shouldn't even have to be said. So if you put a gun to everybody's head and you shoot them, you will eliminate COVID. But there's a big cost to that. No one would, would recommend that, obviously. I'm taking the extreme example. So what they did and what I saw, I was the only person the only one in the task force, and I was only in task force meetings for two months, trying to tell people that we are must take into account the harms of the policies themselves. And Fauci and Burks, who were the, the, the heads of this, 
uh, they didn't think like that. They just said, what? what's the them. rebuttal? What's the rebuttal to this obvious position? No, there are no other factors to optimize or minimize. There is no scientific rebuttal. There was never data. There was never a statement made except an accusation to me in the task force. After I would go through, I, here's the milieu that we're dealing with here. I would come in prepared for a meeting. And so that means I saw the agenda. We're talking about risk to the kids. I would come in with a dozen or two dozen scientific papers. And then the vice president Pence running the meeting would say, Scott, what's your comment on the risk to kids? I would go through a medical science critique of what's happening. Burks they would be turned to, Fauci would be turned to. They had nothing. They never once brought in a scientific paper. They never cited data. You will never hear Fauci cite data in his interviews. He will just say, we don't know this. We're concerned about this. There's never a scientific approach. There was never knowledge shown. The only thing that was rebutted is when Burks would say to me, well, you're an outlier. Okay, that, that's the rebuttal. Right. I mean, this is like completely Or you're shocking. a radiologist, so you don't know anything about viruses. Actually, she she didn't even say that, uh, and I laughingly wrote this in my own book. Uh, she said, you're a fringe epidemiologist. Okay, I, I'm not an epidemiologist. It has nothing to do with epidemiology. This is common sense, critical thinking. You don't need to be an epidemiologist. In fact, you don't want an epidemiologist. I'm a health policy person. Yes. Everything has to be taken into account. That's the job, and this is a gross, unethical, uh, uh, you know, uh, assigned policy to stop COVID-19 at all costs. So, that's point number one. You said, uh, and I think the more interesting thing, and particularly as you, you're a, uh, a you know a behavioral psychologist uh, person who understands, that, because the question here is, why did people go along with these draconian policies? They don't make common sense. Most people have logic. Okay, so uh, despite the fact that bureaucrats. And by the way, bureaucrats have logic too, but they have their own logic. Their own logic as a 38-year bureaucrat like Fauci was to protect his own job, to exert authority. There are all kinds of motivations that are nothing to do with science. But um, the, the acceptance of draconian policies that are contrary to all common sense, I think can be traced to a few things. Number one, fear in, induces irrational behavior. And that's that's true. I think that's a basic you know, human behavioral thing. If you're afraid, you start behaving irrationally, particularly when you're very afraid. And they were, the public was very afraid. And part of the reason was an in insistence on making the public afraid. And this was Fauci's quote to me during one of the meetings. I put this in my book. He leaned across the table. He said, the problem is the public is not afraid enough. Yeah. This is in September, August, September, 2020. And I said, wait a second, the public is incredibly fearful. Can you repeat that? He said, yes, the public is not afraid enough. Okay, that's unethical to use fear to sway the public. The goal here the, in a free society is to use data and let people uh, understand the facts and then they make their own decisions. But in any event, fear. The second thing was lies. There were two lies perpetrated on the public. The first I mentioned, which is if you're choosing if you're against lockdowns, you're choosing the economy over lives. The second lie was that, and this is a complete distortion, a complete falsehood, was that if you're against the lockdowns, you're advocating let the, letting the infection spread without mitigation, the so-called herd immunity strategy. Uh, this was a complete lie. I never advocated letting the infection spread without mitigation. No one did. I never heard anyone even bring it up in the White House. And it was never even discussed in my uh, four months of being in Washington or two months at the task force. Uh, I mean, this is a complete media uh, and, uh, I believe, uh, attack led by people who are committed to lockdowns, that the way to get the public to accept this is to demonize the opposition to it is to make everyone think that if you don't, that these people like me who were saying, wait a second, the actual safer strategy that's going to help save lives because this strategy is failing is to stop the lockdowns and heighten the protection of targeted uh, groups. They were saying we are dangerous. Right. And so right. com combining fear already, you know, the public is afraid. Uh, and then they're being told anyone who counters these policies is dangerous. 
That still holds today, by the way. You know, I mean, the shocking Orwellian, or I don't know if it's Orwell, or I, I always said there was a combination of sort of four things going on to me. Orwell, 1984, Kafka. I, trial, I knew you were going to say Kafka. Right? Right? Uh, the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, which was a complete circular logic discussion. This is what typified the task force and a little bit of catch 22 where these people were just, I mean, laughably uh, insane to the point of being a dark comedy, what I witnessed. But when you have people that are illogical, that are incompetent, that are in charge and they're capitalizing on fear, people can be persuaded. This is how propaganda works. I don't think I have to tell you anything about this. You know more than I do, I'm sure. But when you look at the history of propaganda, yes, we have propaganda in this country. It's not propaganda necessarily controlled by the government, although some of the later latest revelations seem to. But, you know, the censorship, the distortions, this was done during 2020. The harmful censorship, the harmful distortion, the vilification, the demonization of of people like me who were saying that the lockdowns are dangerous. The lockdowns are killing people. And that's factually true. They killed people. Uh, that propaganda was done by the individuals in the media, in the tech companies. That was not directed by President Trump. I mean, this happened during 2020. The harmful propaganda and censorship was done when decisions were made, when the public was swayed, 2020, not during the fourth quarter of 2021, you know, when Jay was censored on Twitter. By fourth quarter, he didn't start Twitter until September 2021. By the time that era rolled around, there were a year and nine months of disastrous uh, harms and manipulation of the public. And so, you know, right. this is the whole, the neuropsychology of what happened is both fascinating and also, uh, I think, frightening because it could happen again. Well, you know, not to plug th this book, The Parasitic Mind, but it, in a sense, it is so relevant to the pandemic. And I, it's not as though I had planned to release The Parasitic Mind during a pandemic. I couldn't have foreseen this. But in the book, what I'm basically arguing is that in the same way that, well, speaking as a neuro radiologist you might find interesting there's a field of neuroparasitology which is the study of parasites but parasites that look to ultimately end up in a host's mind altering its neuronal circuitry to suit typically its reproductive interest and so there are all kinds of science fiction cases in the animal kingdom where these incredible brain parasites can get these hosts to do things that are completely contrary to their interests and so i took that framework from the animal kingdom, the neuroparasitological model. And I argued, well, human beings can be parasitized by another set of brain worms, which I called idea pathogens, postmodernism, mm -hmm. cultural relativism, social constructivism, biophobia, the fear of using biology to explain human behaviors. And so I have this whole class of ideas uh, ideological pathogens, which then I explained, you know, where they originated. Regrettably, they all originated within the university ecosystem. As I always remind people, it takes it, it uniquely takes professors to come up with some of the dumbest ideas. And then I offer later in the book a mental vaccination against many of these ideological parasites, which of course is very relevant to the stuff that you went through, where you have people who are parasitized for all sorts of reasons and unwilling to listen to anything you have to say. So I guess my next question, hopefully one imbued with optimism, what are, you know, having gone through the horrors that you went through, the death threats, the, the cancellation and all that, do, do you have the vaccine to try to inoculate people against this dreadful irrationality? Well, you know, this is a, sort of the question of the day because the question uh, that you're posing, and, and I agree with everything you talk about in in your uh, in your book about how this is the fundamental problem here. We have people, I, I always say this, there were two things that shocked me. The first shock was the unbridled power of the government in a free society to simply shut down schools, businesses, stop you from seeing your elderly parents, quarantining asymptomatic healthy people. But the second shock, and maybe the bigger one, was the acceptance, the acquiescence of the American people to these draconian measures, most of which were completely pseudoscience and illogical. And that's very frightening. And so 
The question is how to stop this from happening again. The first, and, and there is no, I, I, I think, I, I don't want to be negative. I want to be positive. And I am an optimistic person, but there's no silver bullet here. I think the, the most essential component is that we have a, we need to solve. We have a massive void of courage in America, in leadership positions and in individual people. The country uh, failed, failed uh, because there were not enough people with courage to stand up and say what was obvious. I always, and I don't want to make a crude analogy, but I look back historically and always wondered, how did Nazi Germany happen when all these supposedly good people allowed this to happen? And uh, I see how it could happen now. I, I do. And, and this is like, I'm not a history, uh, knowledge, even knowledgeable about history, really. Uh, I, don't, I don't want to make a crude analogy, but it's very concerning that mob rule, and it depends, it happens, and it depends on weakness. It depends on a failure, a moral failure of individuals. So we need individuals with good people. And I think most people are good people. We need people to understand how impactful they are as individuals. We yeah. need good people with a spine to rise up. Why do I say rise up, by the way? Rise up was one of the words I used when Michigan reintroduced draconian measures against all logic and science. And uh, this was, uh, I was deleted from Twitter for this. Yeah. They, and I was censured by Stanford and all this. This was an excuse by Stanford. These, uh, you know, really impotent professors who didn't know anything were freaking out about me standing next to Trump. But uh, I'm trying to help the country. My job was not political at all. But in any event, you know, the, the re word rise up means speak up. Have your voice heard. It has nothing to do with violence. It has to do with what you're not just encouraged to do, you are required in a free society, morally, ethically, to speak up when things are not working, when things are harmful that are being introduced, particularly harmful to the most vulnerable in our society, who are the children, the elderly, the, uh, the poor. And so that's number one. Individuals must rise up. Number two, we need accountability on people in leadership positions. I mentioned this in my talk that you were at, but there are more than 60 private university presidents in the United States earning over a million dollars a year. This is not supposed to be just a job with no responsibility. There's a burden when you're paid a lot of money, particularly in a university, to, to lead. And that burden is lead. Okay, so you need to speak up for what is morally appropriate. These people have introduced required testing vaccines and boosters to healthy children who have no significant risk from the illness. Okay, they can get the illness. They don't have a significant risk from a serious consequence all over the country. We are unique in this country requiring vaccines for children. Other countries, Netherlands, Denmark, Finland, uh, most Western European countries have already said the risk-benefit ratio does not make sense for vaccinating young, healthy people. Yet we are pursuing this and now injecting infants and toddlers. Okay, We need people in leadership positions to have a spine. We need to form a, uh, we need to fix science and uh, make the university science and medical centers uh, accountable on a money basis. Okay, There are more than a dozen university medical schools that receive over $500 million a year from the NIH alone. They're not going to be able to speak out against the NIH because they have the, a sort of a financial corruption. And I'm just saying corruption because, okay, I'm going to be charitable and say it's difficult to bite the hand that feeds you. But, you know, again, right is right. You better speak up. But we don't make these universities accountable for even the free exchange of ideas necessary to science. Right. Okay, right. so we need to have transparency and uh, term limits in these government agencies. And I'm not just talking about the head of the NIH or the head of the infectious disease agency that Fauci's been running for decades. I'm talking about we have people in the CDC. There's a, there, there is a sort of a deep state, to use a, a phrase that has been overused, that we have people whose jobs are to save their own jobs. 
to sway the public rather than to inform. The CDC is supposed to be an information base. It's not supposed to be a rule setter, let alone a propaganda driver uh, or an agenda driver. So we need to get clean house inside these agencies, put term limits on people, and in that way have external people, people whose careers don't depend on a government job, like people like me. I had a 120-day appointment. I wasn't fired. This was another like distortion or something. My job was temporary because... I, and, and that's the beauty of it. I didn't need my job. I, I told Jared Kushner and the people inside the White House when they asked me to help, I said, I just want you to know what you're getting here. I don't need this job. OK, I'm there. I'm not going to change what I say just because somebody, including the president, would tell me to. I'm not going to sign on to a group statement if I disagree with it. And that's what you're getting here. And actually, to Kushner's credit, he said, that's exactly why we want you. Right. Which is shocking. But then he then he went on and said, but by the way, it's going to become public and, and I'm concerned you'll be destroyed. And so I said, well, maybe I'll, I'll do this from California. But then work from California. And so I came back and, uh, you know, uh, hi history unfolded. But, uh, you know, so there are specific things we need to form institutions, by the way, that are not tied to universities. You pointed out something very important that I completely agree with. The common denominator here is the for the poison for the propaganda, for the misuse of guidance is the university. The universities and university professors are entrusted, they are gifted with the trust of the public and the respect by their titles alone, okay? First of all, I'll say this, the era of trusting people because of their titles alone must be over. You need critical thinking. It has nothing to do with your degree or Amen. your title. I mean, you know this. We speak all over the country. I've spoken in places that I had never been in the Midwest, in Indianapolis, North Dakota. 500 people lining up in North Dakota to come see me. And every one of them came up to me for three hours. I was answering questions. And they said, yeah, we understood the data. This was completely illogical what was done. It has nothing to do with your, you're an MD or a PhD. The science was violated. And I'm not talking about PhD science stuff you learn in medical school, stuff you learn in college. I'm talking about high school biology was violated. Like for instance, after you've recovered from a viral illness, you have biological protection against severe consequences. That's a fact that was known early on in this and it was denied by some of these so-called experts uh, inciting really violence on Twitter. So I think we need, uh, you know, we need to have uh, accountability and outside experts come in. And this is one of the problems, if I if I can go on. What they did by, by trying to attack uh, people like me was they put in an, an element of fear into other scientists who would come forward. I got hundreds of emails all over the, all over the world, but particularly from the United States, telling me from scientists and doctors, Scott, keep talking, you're exactly right. We're afraid to come forward. Some people wrote, we're afraid to come forward for our families. This is the country we're living in right now. Now that's so dangerous because self-cancellation, and you, you're you very familiar with this and, and you understand the psychology of it, but it's really just survival. People are afraid. And, uh, you know, at some point, uh that's that that was very harmful in this and i'm i'm afraid for the future and you know this kind of motivation it, it is people under, didn't understand like how 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 could it be that people can can withstand this kind of garbage and i'm not the only one who did i'm not saying that but when you have emails and public support from people personal emails i like got thousands every week from people begging me to keep going including people whose husbands had killed themselves from the lockdown. Daughters had killed themselves from the lockdown and they were begging me to keep talking because they don't want other people to do this. I mean, you know, we, we are at a real, really a catastrophic uh, sort of a moral inflection point in our society if we want to move forward as a free society and an ethical society. You know, your 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 email story resonates very much with me because one of the stories that I like to tell from my own experiences is the the following template of an email, of which, just like you, I've received thousands and thousands. Uh, Dear Professor Saad, my name is Professor So-and-so, fill in the blank, which department, 
thank you for your courage. Uh, so much, so many of us exactly support what you're saying. And then there's always a last sentence to the email. If you decide to read this email on your show, please don't mention my name. And then I always write back very politely, thank you for your kind words. But don't you think that that last sentence is precisely why we are in the current, you know, we're facing the current problem that we're facing. And that oftentimes that kind of wakes them out of their stupor because that that one liner is precisely to the point of why I then say activate your inner honey badger. By Scott Atlas speaking, by God Saad speaking, by many others who, who, who are not beholden to all of these careerist machination calculations, then hopefully others will speak out. But it really is that last sentence that allows this nonsense to go on, correct? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And I don't want to be in the position of blaming individuals because I understand, you know, we, we I, I'm sure you understand the fear of it. Uh, but, you know, again, uh, you know, at some point, you, you, you have to have a bigger picture in mind and it's not for everybody, but I do think, uh, you know, one of the, one of my good friends who, you know, we all lost a lot of friends, but we lost people who were bad people and we gained a lot of friends right. as my optimistic epidemiology uh, friends always tell me. And that's very true. And I'm sure you have made a lot of, I mean, listen, you know, all the, I got to meet that, you. Yeah. We, uh, we all met each other at that conference uh, ironically held at Stanford, which is not a bastion of free speech uh, at all. But, um, you know, we we uh, realized that it's true. When you speak out, if you empower or embolden some other people, the more people that do this, the more and more people speak out. So, okay, the nail sticking out of the board gets hammered down. But on the other hand, uh, other people uh, pick it up. And I think that is the value. And if we all remembered that, I think it would take away the fear because there there is a bigger issue here. Listen, I you know all of us who have children and even those of us who don't, this is not the world or country I want my kids to live in. Uh, a country where uh, freedom is is under threat, where mob rule takes over, where objectivity and science is lost, and where ethics have been just simply put to the wayside. Uh, I, you know we can't have a society like that. We need to have these public discussions. We need to have good people step up. And, and the rest of the world, as I'm sure you know, uh, depends on the United States at some level. If the United States fails, that's a failure for the world. I, you know, I do a lot of traveling, as, as I know you do. And in Europe, for instance, the countries, they had protests by the lockdowns, by the way. We didn't much in the United States. That was shocking that other countries that we viewed as so passive and acquiescent, those are people who protested. But they always do remind me that, you know, without the U.S., freedom is finished yeah. for the world. I, and I think that's not an overstatement. We, we need to fix uh, and, and the, the lack of courage, the, the deficit of courage in Americans and in American leadership. So I like to have people get involved in their local communities. That's another solution here. Everyone is a, is a potential leader, right? I mean, you know, right. it's not just the, the so-called people in the public eye. Uh, and then there are legislative things to do, by the way, that I didn't go into. But I think, for instance, this idea that you cannot sue people who are commenting on so-called public figures, this New York Times versus Sullivan law, yeah. It's very harmful because it incentivizes people to just say whatever they want with no, uh, you know, no, no yeah. recourse. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is not helpful. I, I think that, you know, uh, there, there has to be accountability at so many levels. Transparency is missing at so many levels. And we'll see what happens. Uh, there'll be investigations. I'm very skeptical about them because any investigation done by a government is going to be political, no matter what side it is. Any investigation, even if it isn't political, is going to be viewed as political and therefore will not have credibility with the other political side. So that's not, that has very limited value, although it has to be done. Uh, I would be remiss because I'm looking at the clock and I want to be mindful of your time. And I have still a few questions that I'd like to ask you. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Scott. Uh, so in the parasitic mind, I talk about the 
what I think is the reason why Donald Trump is so reviled by so many of our uh, progressive highfalutin ivory tower types. And so my, and I'm going to propose that theory to you. I'm going to ask you to comment on it. And then I want you to contextualize it in the context of you having interacted with Donald Trump. And so I, I want to get that you know personal insight from you. So I argue that Donald Trump represents an aesthetic injury to the anointed ones, right? To to use uh, Thomas Sowell's you know, right vision of the anointed. Sure. Uh, so because so if I am part of the privileged class, the anointed ones, the ones who went to the right schools, who has the right MD and PhD after my name, I expect that the exemplar of the person who ascends the highest office to the highest office has to speak like me, has to, right? So Barack Obama has a mellifluous voice. He's got a radiant smile. He's tall and lanky. He Every single syllable he utters is pure bullshit, but my God, he looks good. He speaks with the progressive lisp that I expect people in my position and in my class to speak. On the other hand, Orange Himmler, the pig, speaks like an ogre. He's cantankerous. He's disgusting. He's an aesthetic injury to my existential order of life and therefore i viscerally hate him of course i'm speaking now as the progressive person what what are your thoughts about this theory and did you see it manifest itself in your personal dealings with trump or is he a lot more sophisticated than we otherwise think that he is i think your theory is is correct um and i i like to put it into a context uh, 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 it's sort of less about pure aesthetic it's but it is this brand okay the branding idea that uh one of my friends uh michael spence won the nobel prize for back in the early 2000s uh under a different context i came from a very blue collar i, I came from an immigrant uh family my grandparents weren't weren't born here I'm the first generation to go to college. Okay, that's I such have, a beautiful I, point because that's what inoculates you against the aesthetic injury. Yeah, exactly. I have no interest yes. in. In fact, I call out these people. They are the emperors with no clothes. These people are frauds, and they're in the elite class, including almost. Uh, you know, the majority of people that I know at Stanford are from these elite backgrounds. I'm not. And so I don't come in here thinking I'm better than everybody. In fact, uh, because of a background or a title. And so, yes, these people are in, there's it's what I call uh, sort of the arrogance of the elite. It's not, it's obvious, but it's they they actually think that they are superior. Yeah. And most of these people have inherited their pathway to success. Mo if you look around at these Ivy League and elite university campuses, most of them are people whose parents went to Ivy League or elite universities or who were, you know, it, the, the faculty members here, I'm an outlier simply because I was first generation college. Okay, so uh, I don't buy into that at all. And that's one of the reasons why people, I feel one of the basic sort of character traits that you need to call out uh, the, the, the sort of elitism that is so harmful. So I agree with, you know, the, the the cognitive dissonance, the, the the hate of Donald Trump, in part, was certainly due to the fact that he is a disruptor. And what do I mean by disruptor? He's not this upper elite uh, sort of pe person who buys into the status quo. I I view him, and this is just my opinion, as sort of like a, a, a blue collar kind of guy. He's a rich guy, yeah. uh, but but that doesn't mean that's his persona. It's not his persona. Uh, he's he's somebody who, uh, you know, I, OK, my interactions with the president, I was there for, you know, August, September, October and part of November of 2020. In my interactions with President Trump, he was very gracious to me, very thankful to me. Uh, he was self-deprecating. No one would believe that. Right. Um, he he also, uh, you know, uh, asked the right questions uh, and and listened when I gave him the answers. He had my view is he he's not he's not an insider. That's obvious. So all the insiders detest him. Uh, now he has you know there are other issues, and I'm not going to go into uh, any any. It's not a political discussion, but I do think that elites 
they want their own. There, there is a social warfare going, a social class warfare in this country that is far bigger than I had ever thought about. It's not just arrogance. It is a divisive, uh, you know, uh, we see it in the social media. Okay, we see it in the in the, the hate. The, this is a uniquely vicious narrative going on between political parties here. And it's really social class that uh, I think the liberal elite class is the affluent class and the pandemic uh, exposed the disdain uh, for the people of the affluent class toward the people who are the, the lower working class, so much so that they could be sacrificed to deliver their food, to work in the grocery stores, to deliver their Amazon purchases, even without any vaccine or anything else. Uh, and, uh, you know, they are the, quote, essential workers. And yeah. so, uh, meantime, the people in my neighborhood, if the schools were closed, they assembled their PhD friends and co and congregated a micro school that was much better than the school that the kid was attending anyway. There was no downside to that. So um, there's a social class warfare. I think you're right. Uh, Trump, uh, to some extent, was was hated because he's not in that crowd. Uh, there are other issues uh, with the with uh, with Trump. And, I, you know, that's a separate discussion, of course. Uh, you know, we do need leaders who are fearless, who are willing to say the truth. Uh, we need people who can articulate morally and uh, effective, effective, morally correct and effective policies. And there are several people like that, including people who I personally advised since spring of 2020, like Governor DeSantis of Florida. I was going to ask you, what do you think of him? Yes. OK. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I advised uh, also a governor Nome of South Dakota since spring of 2020. And these are people who understand uh, their responsibility. It's not about making enemies out of everybody who's opposed to you. It's about being a leader. Right. Okay. Be because being a leader is more than just knowing the right policies. Being a leader is recognizing you're a leader for everyone. And so uh, there is some uh, rational sort of sanity that has to be, there's leadership qualities in people that I, I never understood how important they were until I saw people who were very flawed leaders and, and encountered people who are very good leaders. Uh, I'll give you a good, you know, I think DeSantis uh, did a great job with the pandemic. He knew the facts. He would call me up since this is since spring of 2020. And he would say, tell me if I'm right. And he would go through the data and he knew the data from not just the U.S. He knew the data from outside the U.S. He knew the state by state. Data. And he and he was essentially always right. He was creative. He for I'll give you an example. He 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 decided instead of like uh, Cuomo of taking of insisting that COVID positive elderly were re reinserted back into nursing homes from hospitals. DeSantis made nursing homes that were only for COVID positive nursing home residents. I mean, this is not that complicated, but he he did that. OK, he made them all over the state. I mean, you know, he just is very smart, at least. Uh, and, and although my wife always tells me smart is overrated. Uh, and that's true because it's it's necessary, but not sufficient. Well, I think uh, he, he's got I mean, to to refer back to the earlier analogy with honey badgers, uh, I think he is combative and fierce in that he he will take on people in the non-traditional way without it being kind of tainted by the the Trump, you know, brand, whatever that means, right? So he's not going to engage in Twitter fights with some nobody because he's thin-skinned. So in a sense, he's at the right sweet spot. He's got the combativeness that many people admired about Trump, right? Without some of the negative aspects of that. Does, does that make sense? I, I, I think you're right. I think that Governor DeSantis, he, he also arms himself with fact. Okay, he didn't depend on anyone to tell him what was going on with the pandemic. He he listened. He did use and bounced off his ideas. Uh, and then, you know, he called me up after I left and said, Scott, let's assemble a group and do a press conference in March of 2021. So we had me, Martin Kaldorf, Jay Bhattacharya uh, in, in, in Tallahassee answering questions. And when it was pulled down by YouTube as misinformation in March of 2021, he called me up immediately the next day on the phone and said, we're going to have another 
uh, conference on how YouTube pulled that down. Okay, so he knows how to act. He's an action-oriented, yeah. very informed, and fearless yeah. leader who, uh, and I, I'll tell you something else about DeSantis that I think is super impressive. He said publicly he made a mistake he should have never shut down in the early days of the pandemic because he opened wide open in August of 2020. And he called me down to Florida and, and we did a tour talking about how schools should be open as the right decision in August of 2020. But I, I think it's impressive to note as a leader, as a public government leader, he admitted he was wrong to shut down in the spring of 2020. I don't know when, I, I don't think I've heard anyone make such an honest self-appraisal who's a, a government elected official. Well, that's very well, impressive. That's you epistemic know, also, humility, right? That's exactly right. I also want to put in a, a, a comment about Governor Nome of South Dakota, who she had a great quote, which her quote was, leadership is, is, is knowing what to do and then having the courage to actually do it. And I think, okay, you know, I think that's that's very important. Uh, I have a lot of respect for people in public positions who understand the responsibility of the public position. It's not a game, it's not about yourself. It's not an ego thing for good people. It's really, you're trying to do the best you can for the, to serve the public. And I think uh, I think DeSantis is is very much cognizant of that responsibility. And I think Governor Noam and, and there are others, uh, you know, Senator Tim Scott is like that of South Carolina, who I had personally, uh, you know, spoken to many times over the pandemic. I, I you know I think Rand Paul is someone with integrity who I've spoken to many times over the public. And on, and on. there there are several others. Uh, so we need people who have the appropriate level of understanding of what the job is to be a leader. It's not about ego. It's not about retribution. It's not about um, making up for a loss. It's about having the right uh, policies and, and leading people. Got you. Last question, uh, and then I'll let you go, and we'll say goodbye officially offline. Uh, having now served of course, only for a short time under, you know, for in the task force of Trump, if a new uh, administration comes to, to town and asks you to serve in some new administrative, you know, political appointee position, would this, would that be something that would interest you? That's part one of the question. And part two, are there any projects that you are currently working on that you'd like to use this opportunity to promote? Take it away. Sure. Thank you. So, uh, you know, in terms of doing something, uh, in a government position, I, I, I really doubt that. I, uh, you know, I, I think Washington, frankly, is poisonous, and partly because of the media, and uh, to a great extent, the media. I think we have a very dishonest press. This is something that uh, I couldn't agree more with President Trump about, which is that the media is vicious and uniquely so in the United States, and I, I don't want to. I, I'm not. I can't see how I would want to voluntarily do something like that. Although I'm always interested in helping, I, I think that I, I, you need to help your country, and so that's a separate consideration. Uh, in terms of what I'm doing now, first I am still a senior fellow at Hoover Institution, where I work on healthcare policy, and I think it's very important as a uh, as a very high quality public policy institute. I'm also uh, involved with two other organizations that I think are very different, but complementary. Number one is Hillsdale College yes. started an Academy for Science and Freedom. I am one of three co-founders under the guidance of Professor, uh, you know, Director Larry, President Larry Arn of the college. I, myself, Jay Bhattacharya and Martin Calder for the three co-founders of this. We are, our goal is to fix science. And that means educating the public about the role of science, putting forward potential solutions for fixing the political bias of the scientific journals, uh, decentralizing funding of research since it's controlled really frankly by a cartel of insiders, including who control by that funding control, they control the careers of every academic scientist at a university because you need an NIH grant. So that's the Academy for Science and Freedom. And then the other bigger picture institute that I'm co-director of is something, the Global Liberty Institute. 
I am a co-director with my colleague at Stanford, Josh Rao, who's an economist, a, 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 a superb economist at Stanford Business School and at Hoover Institution. Uh, Josh and I are co-directors of the Global Liberty Institute, which is an international institute headquartered in Switzerland and the United States, uh, whose goal, whose mission is, is very simple, which is restoring liberty and the free exchange of ideas. And so here we're talking about uh, healthcare uh, autonomy, free market capitalism, free from wokeism, uh, you know, uh, objectivity in the media, free speech on campus, a rational uh, science policy for climate and energy. And we are international because we need to do this it's, it's a joint effort. All free societies have these problems. The U.S. is the leader, of course, but it can't do anything alone. Switzerland is Europe's face of independence and thinking. They don't even uh, join the EU for, for good reasons so far. And um, we also want to be international because our goal is to challenge the very harmful policies of organizations like the World Economic Forum who brag about, quote, infiltrating governments with their disciples like Justin Trudeau, who you, you of course, would- Oh, I know, Trudeau. I know. <laughs> exactly, and uh, the president of Argentina. This is their disciple. This is a very harmful organization, as are others. And we, have, in the Global Liberty Institute, are doing events, getting a consortium of business leaders with academics and policymakers. So we're not just replicating think tanks, we're action oriented, using private sector disruptors to help inform us, as well as starting a young leaders program, which is called Rising Leaders Program to educate, mentor and network people in the first decade or so after college who are in private sector jobs or any other position uh, about principles of freedom and how to navigate the world, because these are the next generation of leaders. We are competing with this young leaders program of the uh, World Economic Forum. And our first event will be in Palm Beach in mid-February of this coming year. The I'm first assuming my Israel. invitation has been lost. You probably got the we wrong. Have not, no, we have not even invited people yet. Uh, but uh, we are, oh, it's an application based for the attendees, not the uh, speakers. Uh, we just put this up on our website, which is uh, global-liberty.org. Uh, and I can encourage your listeners to go to, to look at that. And also, uh, if they want to be involved, they can contact us. And so uh, we, we need to, as you know, I mean, there's a current state of affairs that must be reversed. But we also need to talk to young people for the medium term and, and longer term because the other side has been talking and taking over K through 12 and university speech and all kinds of indoctrinations are going on so that we are now faced with a generation of young people who have no historical perspective whatsoever on what freedom is, right? They don't know about the USSR. They don't know about the Berlin Wall. They they don't they don't they, they don't even know about the 1960s. Okay, so I mean you know really uh, it's really uh, incumbent on us to stop just speaking to each other and really uh, start uh, helping empowering young people because I think most young people are open to facts. They have strident opinions like we all do, but they're open to facts. They're open to discussion, and they there are many courageous young people. Uh, that have, uh, as you know, they're very sensitive to their social network, more so than people our age. And uh, we need to we need to help them navigate this for the longer term. Very exciting projects. It is uh, such a delight to speak to you, Scott. I hope that we will uh, stay in touch. Uh, tr truly a pleasure and a privilege to speak to you. Thank you so much for coming on. Same here. Thank you very much for having me. Great to know you. Cheers. Hi, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed my chat with uh, Dr. Scott Atlas. Truly wonderful conversation. Uh, if you appreciate my efforts and would like to support me, you can do so in one of several ways. Of course, you can share uh, my the YouTube link to the chat or the podcast. You can subscribe to my channel and or the podcast. You can post comments. Uh, you can, of course, support my work directly 
through one of the uh, donation portals, be it Patreon, PayPal, or Subscribestar. Uh, these conversations require a lot of effort and time. And so any way that you can help support my continuing these efforts would be greatly appreciated. I wish you all a great day. Cheers.